Well, good morning. We welcome you all to worship on this fine day, whether you're here with us in person today or joining us online. It is great to come before God together and to find his grace once again for our daily journey. I know that uh, all of you, uh, perhaps like me, found yourself somewhat um, excited by the news that came out of the CDC this week, relaxing masking restrictions. And uh, also, I believe we got the word from the state of Illinois that we've entered into the bridge phase of recovery. Uh, responding to that, those uh, changing realities is part of our plan as a church. We have uh, invited all of us to continue to observe today our normal masking protocols so that we can have time for the leadership team that has been guiding our safety protocols throughout this season uh, to convene early this week and to set uh, new standards. I think you can count on the fact that there will be uh, some new standards around the issue of masking and even capacity limits within our buildings. Uh, And we promise to get out to you via email and our church's website by the end of the week uh, full information uh, about these uh, changes. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to all of you for being patient just a little bit longer as we try and do things in an orderly and thoughtful uh, way. I also want to commend for our prayers today uh, the people of the Middle East as we uh, look to that part of the world and see how desperately the shalom, the peace of God is needed uh, there as in so many parts of our own nation's life. Uh, It is important that the people of God be a people of prayer for these things and we'll be remembering that today uh, in our pastoral prayers. As is our tradition, we'd like to spend just a moment in silence now and prepare ourselves to come before God in worship. Uh, Once again, it is so good to have you in this circle this morning. Uh, Let's open our hearts now to the God who has promised to meet us here. Let's pray just for a moment. Now let us receive this reminder that though we are bound by the powers of earth, we worship a God that is in heaven. We are reminded with these words from Scripture. There is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, our Lord, and shall glorify your name in your name alone. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are our God. With these words in mind, may we stand and join our voices together in worship.
You may be seated. As we enter into the house of the Lord, may we do so humbly, with contrite hearts, recognizing that in each and every moment of our day, we fall short of the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come before you today, we are humbled by the words of your prophet Isaiah, as he calls us to turn to you in recognition of the mercy you will have on us. And we are reminded that you have declared that our thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are our ways your ways. Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways, and your thoughts higher than our thoughts. Lord, in our pride, we admit that we have placed ourselves upon the throne of heaven, and we have trusted in our own thoughts and our own ways to guide our path. We have elevated our desires, our ideologies, and our worldviews above yours. And we find ourselves as a result in a world divided by sin, anger, and brokenness. Lord, today we call upon your mercy and your forgiveness as we confess our sins. Amen. May we also be encouraged today by the same prophet Isaiah, who in Isaiah chapter 55 tells us that we are to seek the Lord while he may be found. We are to call on him for he is near. Let the wicked and the sinful and the broken forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and He will have mercy on them, and to our God, for He will freely pardon. Amen.
May we be encouraged that while we worship a God who is seated eternally in heaven, we also worship a God that is intimately aware of our deepest burdens, hurts, and failures, a God that intercedes on our behalf. And it is with this promise in mind that we present our prayers before Him, both as a congregation, but also individually in our own spirit. Let us pray. Lord, today we come before you longing for heaven. We experience the fallenness of this world and look forward in anticipation to the day in which you will usher in a new heaven and a new earth. However, today we call upon your power in heaven to meet us here now in our brokenness. Lord, during a season of uncertainty and chaos, we pray for those that find themselves wandering and lonely. And we call upon your heavenly power as the shepherd to lead them to new pastures. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, in a year marked by political division and turmoil, we call upon you as the King who sits eternally in heaven to rule in our lives. May you make your sovereignty known to all. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, today, we specifically pray for the unrest in the Middle East, for the brokenness, the wars, and the fears of war. We know that you are the God of peace. May you pour down your Spirit upon us as we seek to reconcile the turmoil of this world. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, the COVID-19 virus and the numerous other effects of sin have taken the lives of many this past year. And so, Lord, we call upon you as our comforter to sit with those that mourn, to wipe their tears, and to turn their eyes toward heaven. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, we lift before you the many in our community that are suffering from illnesses of all kinds who are experiencing the effects of cancer, sickness, and pain. Lord, you are our healer. And we pray that you would pour down your power upon us. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, we know that relational discord has broken the bonds of friendship, family, and marriage. That on the surface all appears well, but internally our hearts ache. And so, Lord, we call upon you as the wonderful counselor to intercede on our behalf. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, it is with these prayers and all of those that remain unspoken that we call upon your power which is rooted in heaven to flood down upon us, your church and your bride. May we today experience a glory that can be attributed to you and you alone. And now together, Lord, in light of your promises, we pray the words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are so thankful that you have chosen to join us today. I am Pete Stearns, and I am our pastor of growth and family life here at Christ Church. And we are a church that loves to welcome new folks into our fold. So if today you find yourself sitting in the pews or tuning in online for the very first time, we want to welcome you. We are glad that you are here, and we want to encourage you to connect with us. Whether it is your first Sunday or you have been here a while and are just looking to get more plugged in, we want to encourage you to have a conversation with us today. I will be out in the narthex after the service. We have hosts for you online. Make sure you take a moment to stop and introduce yourself so that we can know your name. Or if you uh, would prefer, you can also go to Christchurch.us forward slash connect. And we will follow up with you later this week. Another way for all of us to get more connected into the life of the church is by subscribing to our weekly update. Each week, our wonderful team puts together uh, an update apprising uh, us of all of the wonderful things that are happening here in the life of the church. It comes out every Wednesday. And it is an attempt to help us as a large community come together intimately in awareness of how God is moving in this congregation. We've got some great things in the works for the months of the head, like our festivals of Keys concert and an outdoor worship service on the Saturday before Father's Day. And by subscribing to our weekly update, you will make sure that you are in the know about all of these uh, wonderful opportunities. You'll also get previews for what is to come on each and every Sunday, as well as hearing the life-changing stories of our mission partners and how our tithes and offerings are making an impact globally for the kingdom of God. So take a moment today to sub subscribe to our weekly update so that you can be plugged in as we head into an exciting summer together. Well, one of my favorite stories in Scripture is found in Luke chapter 21. Jesus and his disciples and a crowd of people are gathered together in the temple. And you see, they are watching as the nobles and significant players in the community come forth with their offerings. You see, each of these people uh, do so with much pomp and circumstance. And the gifts that they give are financially significant. But in the midst of all of the fanfare comes an interruption. A poor widow walks forward and timidly places two small coins in the offering. You see, I'm sure in this moment that the crowd is already looking past her. Who else will come? What donations might be made? But Jesus instead uses this as an opportunity to identify that this small gift is in fact the greatest of which has been given that day. And he points out that this gift has not been given from the excess of wealth, but instead out of a spirit of obedience. But you see, the verses that follow bear much eternal significance for you and I, and they are often missed in this familiar made-for-Sunday school story. You see, Jesus uses the story of the widow to segue into a reminder of the temporary state of the physical world that we find ourselves in. He tells all of those around him to look around, to look at the beautiful things that they have created, the gold, the stones the impressive temple that surrounds them. And as they reflect 
upon the works of this wealth, Jesus says in verse 6, as for these things that you see, the days will come where there will not be here left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You see, when we live like the widow, when we live in recognition that our current reality is not the goal, but instead that our lives, our hearts, and our resources are rooted only in the one thing that will last, the salvation of Jesus Christ our Lord, then we live with an understanding that all that surrounds us is temporary. And we trust in the promise that our God, who is seated in heaven, reigns supreme. And that all we do is useful only in how it promotes his glory and his kingdom. It is with this in mind that we take a moment to humble our hearts before our God and to reflect on how we might usher in this new heaven and earth. I believe. I believe. I believe that Jesus came to earth. He was born of a virgin. He walked among us. Loved the least and the lost. He was mocked, beaten, suffered, crucified for our sins. For my sins. Jesus died and was buried. On the third day, Jesus was resurrected. 
He then appeared to Mary, Thomas, Peter, James, Paul, and many others. I believe Jesus appeared to the disciples and commanded, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he commanded. He is with us always. To the very end of the age, Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. This I believe. To set the context for this, I want to take you to a scene that gets recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. To set the scene, it has been about 40 days since Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. His disciples and uh, he have been interacting with each other. He has been instructing them, equipping and preparing them to carry forth the mission uh, that Uh, he has been articulating with the whole of his life up to this point. And and he's been talking with them about the role they're going to have now in the mission going forward. And the fact that they are struggling to get this, to really take in what he's been trying to say to them all along is evidenced in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 where we read, and I quote, Then the disciples gathered around Jesus, and they asked him, Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, after all of the time that they have spent with him up to this point, the disciples are still thinking that Jesus has come to throw out the tyrannical power of Rome. They are still holding this understanding of Jesus' messiahship in very political and military terms. And they're hoping that he's going to throw out Rome and establish Israel as an independent political kingdom. Jesus, however, has his eye on a much larger kind of revolution, far uh, more significant, world-altering kind of revolution. Christ's aim was nothing less than to throw out the power of sin and establish his kingdom in every human heart. His goal is to throw out the ultimate tyranny, not that which comes from the outside, but that which works on us from the inside, and to establish from within a new kind of kingdom that will then move out through human behavior and action to change the external world. And this is the nature. When Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, he's saying, this is the nature of power as I think about it. And he's been trying to get the disciples to appreciate it. Because the first disciples were still missing it at this point, Jesus goes on to say to them on that day long ago, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by his own authority. And by that he means it's not for you to know when God is going to finally and fully restore the whole of his creation. But here's what you can know, Jesus is about to tell them. Here's what you can know. Here's what you can put your trust in. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, the change in power you guys keep looking for out there. How many times do we hear people uh, talking as if our great hope as a human species is in better governments out there? Not to say that better governments would not be beneficial for all of us in all times. But, but Jesus is trying to help them understand that what I want to give you in here is the ultimate gift, so that you will be my witnesses, so that your life will flow out in a way that witnesses to my nature and to my kingdom, and you will be a witness like this in Jerusalem, right where you live, in uh, all Judea in the region around you, in Samaria, the places you find it scary to go, and to the very ends of the earth. After he said this, Jesus was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Or as the Apostles' Creed would soon put it, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
When our oldest child was a little boy, one of his simple joys was obtaining a helium balloon. I mean, you could make the kid's day by giving them a a helium balloon. Maybe your kids love those too. You, 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 you might as well have given him a flying puppy on a leash. <laughs> it was just that exciting for our little one and he'd walk along, you know, tugging on the screen, on the string and watching the balloon uh, uh, bouncing in the air. It was just a tremendous guaranteed thrill for him until he lost his grip on the string. You've been there, right? And in a nanosecond, the moment would go from this delirious joy to this total meltdown as the balloon rose up and up and up and out of sight. And of course, eventually as parents, we learned you got to tie the string around the wrist or to the stroller or something like that. But the first time that balloon went up, it was not a great family moment for us. (laughs) When I picture those disciples gazing up into the sky as Jesus went away, I think it must have been a pretty rough family moment. Uh, I should tell you that we've got no idea actually whether Jesus ascended in the way that a helium balloon does. Uh, The biblical text simply says that he was taken up and that a cloud hid him from their sight. Uh, We remember that the scriptures often use the image of a cloud to suggest the presence of an enveloping mystery of God's action. And the statement that Jesus was taken up could, I suppose, just as easily mean that he disappeared as that he rose vertically like some kind of a balloon or skyrocket. Any way you understand the imagery that's there, if I were one of those disciples, the moment would be a rough one. Like a kid leaping to try and reach for a disappearing string, I'd want to say, wait, Jesus, come back. Wait, there's still so much to be done. Don't leave us. This job you've given us, it's too big. We can't do it without you. Can you understand something of that feeling the disciples may likely have felt that day? Have you ever felt like it was actually a bad thing that Jesus ascended into heaven? That it would have been far better if he just stayed around a lot longer, even into our time, to be here physically present with us and to guide us through all of the challenges of our lives. I can think of a few people who would probably improve the world by leaving it, but Jesus isn't one of them. So how is it not like a great coach leaving her team on the verge of the championship game? How is this ascension not like a a great general retiring on the eve of the revolution he has planned? How could it be a good thing that Jesus ascended into heaven? Well, it's interesting to note that as natural as that kind of a sentiment is, I suppose, it's not the way that centuries of Christians thought about it. I don't know if you are aware of this, but for many, many centuries, Ascension Day, which by the way was just this past Thursday, was celebrated with as much vigor and joy as Christmas and Easter in the Christian community. Wow. There was much pomp and circumstance and excitement about Ascension Day as about Christmas and Easter. Why was that? How is it that Christians looked at this particular event in that kind of a positive uh, way? In fact, some parts of Europe today, it's still a national holiday, Ascension Day is, though most don't think about the roots of that tradition any longer. These days, Ascension Day, if it ever gets even mentioned at all, is lost somewhere between Easter and and Pentecost. So again, why did the earlier Christians make such a positive big deal about it? Well, the first reason that the Ascension is really good news for us is because the departure of Jesus signals the arrival of the Holy Spirit. 
In one of his final conversations with his disciples, Jesus actually says this, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. It's for your good that I'm going away because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. As long as Jesus was physically present on earth, he could only be in one place. He could only be with one group of people at a time. But when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, Jesus could now be with anybody, anywhere, at all times. He's with me right now. He's with you right where you are right now. Jesus is over here. He's over there through the power of his spirit. He's with Christians all over planet Earth right now, teaching his word, comforting us in our pains, empowering us with gifts, every bit as significantly as the earthly Jesus once did with only a small band of disciples in one tiny little corner of the world. And if you need empirical evidence that this is true, that the leaving of Jesus and the coming of the Spirit made a dramatically greater impact possible, just picture again that tiny band of disciples gathered there on that ascension day, staring at a vast world with no knowledge of the kingdom of God or the ways of Jesus, and think of the world today. More than 2,000 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, leaving behind that tiny band of believers, there are now 2.382 billion followers of Jesus on this planet. People who are committed to following the way of Jesus Christ, many of them meeting today to listen for his teaching, to draw on his comfort, to be filled afresh with his power, and that doesn't count the billions of other people that Jesus has met and shaped and brought into eternal relationship with God through his Holy Spirit in the generations before ours. This is one reason why it is very good that Jesus ascended. But it's important to remember, I think, that Jesus didn't just go up or just disappear. He went somewhere particular. He ascended into heaven, the creed says. Now I know that when some of us hear that word heaven, particular images come to our mind. Uh, we think maybe of some place up in the clouds or we picture some kind of divine Disney world, or in our most exhausted moments, it's the ultimate spa that we'll get to one day. But biblically speaking, the word heaven means the invisible place where God is fully known and fully obeyed. It's a place where he is fully experienced and where his will is perfectly done. It's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as it's already being done in heaven. Some of us, I think, also have this tendency to think of Jesus as being really quite busy when he was here on the earth, uh, going from place to place, healing and teaching and doing all of these wonderful things but now, as he's gone off to heaven, he's sort of retired. Jesus is more or less retired. Uh, he's like somebody who was a great CEO when he was here. But since he's moved on, he's mostly resting or he's playing some heavenly pastime or he's just finally admiring the great view from heaven. Oh, he was a serious player once, but he's no longer in the game. Check your own perceptions on this. How easy is it to start to think of Jesus in those ways? This is, of course, not what the Bible teaches at all. At the start of the book, we call the Acts of the Apostles, the book's writer, Luke, who is the same doctor who wrote the gospel according to Luke, says this, and these are important words for us. 
In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Did you catch the important phrase there? All that he began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Luke is telling us that what we read about in the Gospels is not the end of the Jesus story. It's just the beginning of all that Jesus is going to do and to teach. And and this points up the second reason why the ascension is, I think, really great news. It means that Jesus is now at work from the highest place of power and influence possible. In human terms, Jesus did not retire. Jesus did not even redeploy. Jesus was promoted. (laughs) He was so faithful and effective in his work on earth, Scripture says, that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And the reason why the historic church gave as much or more attention to Ascension Day as they did to Christmas or Easter is because they understood that the uh, incarnation of Jesus in that manger or the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus from that empty tomb were simply preludes to the even more important reality that now Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, which is to say he's on the throne He's taken the seat of ultimate power now. He was vulnerable on earth. He's in the place of the highest authority now. And at this very moment, when you and I are sitting right here where we are, Jesus is actively directing the affairs and the advancement of his kingdom everywhere. He has given disciples like you and like me a very important role to play in the work of his kingdom and in the affairs of this planet for sure, but Jesus has not transferred authority in heaven and on earth to human proxies. What did Jesus say as he was about to commission the disciples? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to whom? To him, he still has it. He has not left the world up to human beings alone. He's Lord. He's directing it all. He's reigning in power over this creation. And he has promised that in his time and in his way, his kingdom will come. His will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven right now. Think about this. Think about the implications of this. British scholar N.T. Wright says, to embrace the ascension is to heave a sigh of relief. It's to give up the struggle to be God and with it the inevitable despair we feel at our constant failure. And it's to enjoy our status as creatures, image-bearing creatures, but creatures nonetheless. Here's what I think it means for you and me. As we live continually today within the influence of the greatest anxiety-creating machinery ever to exist on planet Earth, the great media and political engines of our time, leaving us in a constant state of exhaustion and worry to hold our attention, to gain market share, as we live in that kind of a context, we don't need to be thrown into a tizzy. We don't need to be overtaken and overrun by those who say that the sky is falling or conspiracies are everywhere. We don't need to panic because things are messy and conflicts are happening, and they are. Jesus told us it would be this way. In this world, you will suffer. There will be stupidity. There will be sin. But be brave, he says, because I've overcome the world. I'm in control of this world. I've already begun the process by which evil will be subdued. So our job, men and women and children, is to be courageous 
Our job is to be faithful. His job is to be king. Because he is. Because he's capable of it. I find this encouraging. I hope you find it encouraging. But it's not all that the Apostles' Creed tells us that is. We're also told that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. If you know anything about Jesus, then you know how much his relationship with his heavenly Father meant to him. There were probably two subjects Jesus dwelled on more than anything in his teaching, if you go back and and look at it carefully. Uh, One was the kingdom, the nature of the life that he was bringing into being here on earth. And the other was the character of his dad, the character of his father. During his earthly ministry, he was always talking about his Abba, the Aramaic word for dad. From the story of the prodigal son to the many uh, tales he told about kings and masters of various kinds, most of Christ's parables were aimed at helping people to understand the heart of his heavenly father. He said to his disciples once, I came from the Father and entered into the world. I am leaving now the world and going back to the Father. Jesus was so excited about returning to his Father in heaven. In fact, he was excited about ascending into heaven because that's where his dad was. That's where his father was. And the joy of the reunion he was anticipating with his father is just a foretaste of the ultimate reunion you're going to have or communion you're going to have if you put your trust in Christ with that same heavenly father. In my father's house, there are many rooms and I am going there to prepare a place for you I don't know all of what heaven is going to be like, but I have this image of us getting there and Jesus comes up to us and he greets us. He's got this huge grin on his face and this utter expression of love and delight and he throws his arms around us in this welcoming embrace and we feel like we are home in a way that Only the greatest experiences of home we had in this world could even give us a tiny taste of. And then Jesus steps back from the embrace and he looks into our eyes and he says with such joy and anticipation, now you've got to meet my dad. He's been waiting for you. This is where Jesus is now. This is the place to which Jesus ascended. Heaven is a place that is defined by the glorious presence of the most amazing Father, someone with whom the Son has an unimaginably intimate communion. And this is why it is such good news, thirdly, that Jesus ascended because Christ is now home with his Father And he is preparing a place for us. For our homecoming. Not so much a literal room with four walls. As a place in our Heavenly Father's heart forever. But there's even more good news. The ascension is also good because now Jesus is interceding with the Father on our behalf. I am nothing close to the character of the Heavenly Father. I pray to grow in that character more and more. I need to grow more and more. I'm not like that Heavenly Dad, but with some regularity, one of my boys will come to me and intercede on behalf of one of their friends. A dad, one of them will say, so-and-so is trying to get into this school, and I was just wondering, would you be open to writing a recommendation for her? She's nervous. She doesn't want to ask, do you mind? 
writing that recommendation. Or, or Papa, you know so-and-so. Well, he could really use some advice right now. Could, could, could you set aside some time to, 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 to talk with him? Or so-and-so need, needs a job or he needs an introduction or some kind of financial help. Dad, could you give that? Could you help with that? And most of the time, I know who so-and-so is. They've been in our house. We've been at their house. I've watched them grow up. I'm thrilled to help out in any way because I love that particular person too. But because it is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, who is asking me to extend this grace, I can't wait to answer that request. Do you see where I'm going? (laughs) Do you see what it means? That Jesus is interceding for you with the Heavenly Father. The Apostle Paul says, Christ who, Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And what that means is that if you are a friend of Jesus, which is, by the way, just another word for a disciple, then you have got power on high working for you. The scriptures say that Jesus is our high priest. He is our mediator. He is the one who goes between us and the heavenly father for our benefit. When the day of judgment finally comes and we're there at the, at the mercy seat and the enemy, the Satan, is the great accuser and he's calling out all of the reasons why God should deny us. Jesus will be standing there interceding on our behalf his hands nail-pierced, having done the Father's will. And we don't have to worry about the verdict because of that reality. All of this is to say, as Pastor Tim Suttle observes, that the ascension is not an optional add-on to the story. It's not a piece that we may choose to discuss if we have any time after dealing with the important parts. The ascension, says Subtle, is critical. The ascension is when the king rules. It's when the priest represents. It's when the spirit comes. It's when the people serve. It's when the future shines with the brilliance of God's plan. Jesus didn't just ride off into the sunset leaving us to clean up the mess that he left behind. Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father so that God's plans could be accomplished. And once we really understand this, says Subtle, we'll agree that it was truly better for us that Jesus should go. Do you see that now a little bit more? Does this make sense to you? The biblical story of Ascension Day ends with those 12 disciples not yet fully getting it. The text says they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Take your eye off the balloon, they said. Or in other words, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. The story is told of a little boy who was out one day flying a new kite. And as the gusts began to build, they carried the kite higher and higher and higher into the sky until the colors of the kite actually disappeared in the mists above. An adult came along and saw the little boy standing there and he asks that kind of crushing question. 
How do you know the kite is still attached to the string? And without taking his eyes off the sky, the little boy replied, because I can feel it pull. Ray Pritchard writes, the same is true for us today. Christ is pulling us. He's pulling us towards heaven, our eternal home. We may not see him with our eyes, but we feel the tug in our hearts. We know where he is and that where he is, we will someday be. Every day, Jesus tugs on our hearts, pulling us up so that when we finally get there, we will not feel like strangers. One day, the Lord will return, or before then, he'll give us one final tug and we'll end up in the place to which he has ascended. Beloved, would you please pray with me? Almighty God, whose blessed Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, mercifully give us faith to perceive that according to his promise, he abides still with his church on earth, even to the end of the ages, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. And now I want to invite you, whether you are at home or right here in the sanctuary, to stand to your feet and let us together recite what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
For one final time today, we're going to request that those of us who are here present in the sanctuary uh, remain in their place until our ushers have come to dismiss us from our sections. And for all of us who are at home and those of us here, think about this for just one moment. What if the world is not, as the medievals believed, a place of layers? Where to go to heaven, you have to literally go up. What if the universe is such that heaven is simply a vibration of frequency away from this place where you stand right now? That it is as close as your own heartbeat, that it's accessible in an instant at God's will. What if you're living that near to the Father already, to Jesus and his spirit, and that their power is possible in your life as you simply awaken to that reality. Take that with you as you go from this place. Seek out the way of the Lord in all of your going, humbly lifting up those who may have fallen down. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you this day. And until we meet together again, And until one day we stand with Jesus face to face and forevermore, amen. Happy Ascension Day.